Hey guys, this is Kate. Today I'm going to be talking about chapter 8, which covers making decisions and problem solving. I really hope that you have some knowledge of this, but if not, grab a pen and some paper and start taking notes, because sooner or later you are going to need to make some decisions. So to start off, what is decision making? Well, it's the process of deciding among various alternatives, whether you're trying to decide between what car to get or an apartment or even what you want to have for dinner. There's multiple options and you need to choose. In order to choose, you're going to want to apply your past knowledge, synthesize and evaluate alternatives through reasoning to reflect on a course of action. To make a good decision, Map out a strategy for making the choice that is best for you. Every decision can benefit from your systematically thinking through the options involved. Which brings us to the power plan. Pretty simple. It starts with P, which is to prepare. Every decision starts with the end in mind, the goal that you wish to accomplish. Identifying the goal that underlines the decision ensures that you make a decision that will actually get you closer to that goal. Crazy, right? So once you know where you're trying to get, you're going to want to organize. Every decision is based on weighing various alternatives. So determining what those alternatives are and the possible consequences is probably the most important and most difficult part of decision making. For many decisions, there are choices beyond the this or that alternatives. And how can you be sure that you've actually considered all the possible options? Well, using the technique of free writing is a great way to do that. Free writing is where you write continuously for a fixed period of time, like five or ten minutes, and list as many different ideas as possible without stopping. doesn't matter whether they're crazy or not. Just anything that could potentially happen. In free writing, evaluating the actual worth of the ideas that you've generated comes later. But you just want to come up with as many alternatives and consequences as you possibly can. Once you've actually generated the extensive list of alternatives, you need to assess them. So first, determine the possible outcomes for each alternative. Each alternative, sorry. And then determine the probability that those outcomes will take place. After that, you're going to want to compare all the alternatives, taking into account all of the potential outcomes. Obviously, not every decision requires such an elaborate process. In fact, most of them won't, but when it comes to major decisions that could have a big impact on your life, it's worthwhile to take the time and use this process. Once you've assessed all the alternatives and their outcomes, you need to actually work and make a decision. <laughs> The reason that important decisions are difficult is the alternatives you have to choose from carry both benefits as well as costs. Choosing one alternative means that you have to accept the costs of that choice and give up the benefits from the other ones. Now that can be pretty hard. If you find yourself stuck in this, there's a lot of ways to handle it. First, you can give the decision time. Time really does fix everything. You could think of additional, additional alternatives, and that might sway your opinion one way or another. Another thing you could do is make a mental movie and act out the various alternatives. Now, we all do this, especially when you're in the shower pondering life. Just think about what will happen if you choose to finance the $30,000 car instead of buying one that's $5,000 that you aren't going to have to make payments for for the rest of your life. Another thing you can do is toss a coin. This really isn't as crazy as it sounds. If you toss a coin, as soon as the coin is in the air, you're automatically going to feel one way or another. And if you don't, 
once you see the actual outcome, you're either going to be okay with it or you're going to realize that that's not actually what you want to do. And the last thing is go with your gut feeling. We really do know best and call it how you see it. Sometimes our intuition knows more than the rational process could teach us. So once you actually make the decision, you need to evaluate. Did you make the right decision? Even if you spent time and mental effort in thinking through a decision, you still need to consider the results. Even well-considered decisions can end up being wrong, either because you neglected to consider something or because it's changed, either you or the situation. A great quote from Theodore Roosevelt is, In any moment of a decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The next best thing is the wrong thing. And the worst thing you can do is nothing. It's really important to just keep calm and accept the fact that you're going to make wrong decisions. Everyone does. It's only bad if you don't do anything or if you don't learn from it. Last but definitely not least is rethink. Reconsider your goals and your options. We can get to most places by multiple routes. There's the fastest and the most direct route. And then there's the longer, more scenic route. Both take us to our destination, though. So there's not just one way to do everything. And making a wrong decision doesn't mean that you totally screwed up and there's nothing you can do. It's just taking you a little bit longer to get to your ultimate goal. And that's perfectly fine. So obviously, if you're just trying to decide what you want to eat, you probably don't have to go through all these steps but it wouldn't hurt to. With that being said, SLS is in 20 minutes and you haven't eaten all day. You're starving. Where are you gonna go? Taco Bell or McDonald's? Let's say that Taco Bell's closer, but you're going on a date with a girl tonight and might not want to be running to the bathroom every 10 minutes. Taking that into consideration, you might want to go with McDonald's, although I'm not sure if that's much of a better choice. As you can see, even with the little decisions, systematically thinking through the alternatives can definitely pay off in the future. Alright, so going hand in hand with decision making is problem solving and applying critical thinking to find solutions. There's a multitude of ways to do this, and I'm just gonna cover a couple. But these are ones that are really applicable and I personally use in my life quite often. So first, break the problem down into smaller, more manageable pieces. I cannot stress this enough. No matter what it is, if you break it down, it becomes a lot less intimidating, and as you reach each smaller sub-goal, eventually you're going to get to the answer or your ultimate goal before you even know it. Another thing you can do is work backwards. Sometimes you know the answer to the problem, but not how to get there. And in that case, it's best to work backwards. You can always consider the opposite as well. Problems can sometimes be solved by considering the opposite of the problem you're seeking to solve. For example, to, to define good mental health, try to define bad mental health. All of a sudden, it gets a lot easier. Another thing you can do is take someone else's perspective. By viewing a problem from another person's point of view, it's often possible to obtain a new perspective on the problem that'll make it way easier to solve. Because of what we've experienced in life, we have a predisposed way of thinking, and that often hinders our ability to solve problems and make decisions in some contexts. So definitely taking another's perspective can be beneficial. 
All right, so we have gone over a couple ways to solving messier problems in life, but what about smaller, tricky ones like this? What day follows the day before yesterday if two days from now will be Sunday? Think about it. And also, if you pulled out a pen and paper to take notes, I would definitely write this down. We are going to be asking for the answer in class on Wednesday. So again, what day follows the day before yesterday if two days from now will be Sunday? I want you to come to class with an answer as well as the strategy to how you solved it. And I'll give you a hint, it is not one that I covered, but it's definitely one that you should know of and we will be talking about in class on Wednesday as well. So moving on, keep calm and don't fool yourself. <laughs> Being able to think clearly and without bias is the basis for critical thinking. Here are some of the decision making and problem solving pitfalls to look out for and avoiding them will help improve your critical thinking greatly. Don't assume giving something a name explains it. Holy crap, I cannot stress this enough. Tumblr people, you do not all have insomnia and every skinny girl does not have an eating disorder, okay? That is like my biggest pet peeve. But anyways, some examples. Why do I have so much trouble falling asleep? Because you have insomnia. No, I'm just gonna leave it at no, because I, I can't with the whole insomnia thing. Why did the defendant shoot those people? Because he's insane. Um, no, there's a lot of reasons why someone might shoot someone. You don't know him, and you don't know what he's been through. Just kidding. But no, just calling him insane does not explain it. Why is he so unsociable? Because he's an introvert. Okay, no. <laughs> Again, just no. None of these provide an explanation. And assuming that someone really is an introvert because they're unsociable or any of the other examples is so small-minded and definitely a pitfall to critical thinking. Please, 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 please be smarter than that. All right, another major pitfall to critical thinking is confusing opinion with facts because so many people walk around town saying their opinions as if they're facts and it's really deceiving and this is where skepticism comes into play greatly but opinions are not facts and although we may be aware of this simple formula almost all of us can be fooled into thinking that someone's opinion is the same as fact so as professor garfield gracefully explains in this little comic um, you can see in the first box here, cheese, salami, pastrami, bologna. Well, if that was a real sandwich, it would be easier to depict, but we're going to assume that all of those things are on there. So that is a fact. You can see it. You can't ask any more questions because he lists the things and they are there. In the second box, pickles, cheese, more cheese. I really don't see pickles there. But again, I'm just going to assume that if that was a real sandwich, they would be there. And that is a fact. They are clearly there. Then he goes on to say, there. The perfect, I think that's 16 layer sandwich, which is ridiculous. But is that a fact? Okay. Maybe there are 16 layers. But he says that it's the perfect 16 layer sandwich. That is definitely not a fact. That is an opinion. Because you can follow up and say, well, what exactly is your definition of perfect? And then jumping to the last little box where 
Nermal. <laughs> I don't know who who that is or what his name is. But um, this little gray kitty cat over here got an F on his report card. And you can blatantly see the F. So that is, again, a fact. The third major pitfall that I see a lot of people falling into is confusing correlation with causation. This graph is perfect to demonstrate this. It is used by the Pastafarians, the religion of the flying spaghetti monster, to explain global warming. And they explain it as the shrinking pirate population. So as this graph shows, um, the number of pirates on the planet since the 1800s has significantly decreased and global temperatures have obviously increased. Does that really mean that the temperature is getting warmer because there are less and less pirates? No, that is just silly. But there is a graph, so it has to be true. Again, no. Don't confuse correlation with causation. In the book, they have an excellent example. <clears throat> it says, 89% of juvenile delinquents use marijuana. Does this mean that smoking marijuana causes juvenile delinquency? Think about it. No, it definitely doesn't. It's pretty safe to say that 100% of juvenile delinquents grew up drinking milk. And does milk cause delinquency? No. So associating marijuana with the delinquent behavior is absolutely ridiculous, just as pirates and the global temperature raising. All right, so we discussed the power plan, critical thinking, and some of the major pitfalls to avoid. I hope this wasn't a complete waste of your time, and if it was, I'm sorry, yell at me on Wednesday. I didn't mean to be super boring. Um, but come with an answer to the try it, and come with the strategy that you used. I'm really curious to see how everyone solves this. Um, it will be BYOB, and I will see you then. Take care.